All right, well, we're there in John uh, chapter 15. And if you look at verse number one, the Bible says, this is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking, of course. He said, I am the true vine, and my father is a husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. And you need to understand, what we, what we gather from this chapter and what the Lord Jesus Christ is really focusing on here is that God and the Lord Jesus Christ is in a fruit-bearing business. He is interested in us seeing much fruit. Now, you don't have to turn here, but let me just read this verse for you out of Romans 1.13. Paul said this, Now, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto. And he said this, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. And we know that fruit is, the idea there is of production. Apple trees produce apples, and Christians produce other Christians. And God and Jesus are interested in you and in I bearing fruit. Now here's what's, what's interesting, and there's so much that could be said out of this chapter, and I'm not going to go through and preach verse by verse in it, but I just want you to notice a, verse, a few things. Number one, Jesus is not happy when we do not produce fruit. Look at verse 2 again. He says, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, notice, he taketh away. Jesus is not interested in wasting time on a Christian that's not going to produce fruit. Now look, if you're not producing fruit, you're not winning souls, you're not getting people saved, Jesus loves you, Jesus wants the best for you, He wants you to grow, but here's what He wants from you more than anything, He wants you to bear fruit. He says, look, if you're not bearing fruit, I don't have time for you. Now notice, look, look at the last part of verse 2, and every branch that beareth fruit, so the branch that is bearing fruit, He purgeth it, why? He spends time with it, He, he cleans it, He matures it, why? That it may bring forth, notice, more fruit fruit. He's interested in one thing. He wants you to bear fruit. And when you begin to bear fruit, he says, I'm going to purge you. He says, I'm going to clean you. He said, I'm going to, I'm going to get you to the place where you can begin to bear more fruit. Skip down to verse 8. Notice what it says. Verse 8. And you cannot get away from this. You, you just need to understand this about Jesus. Verse 8 says, herein is my father glorified. You say, you know, I'm, I'm a believer. I, I got saved. I started coming to church. I started coming to Faithful Word. I started learning. I want to glorify God with my life. I want to bring glory to God the Father with the things that I do. Well, Jesus tells us, herein is my Father glorified. Notice that ye bear much fruit. Amen. If you want to bring glory to God with your life, God, he, he says, look, I want one thing from you. He said, I want you to bear fruit. I want you to produce. I want you to bring more Christians. He said, so shall ye be my disciples. How are you? One of, the, one of the characteristics of being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ is the fact that you're bearing fruit. Now, let's skip down to verse 16. Notice what it says. And here's really what I want to preach about and talk about this morning. Verse 16 says this, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. That's what we've been talking about, right? But here's what I want you to focus on this morning. Notice, and that your fruit should remain. You see that word remain there? The idea there, that word remain, what that's talking about is that it should continue, that it should go on. And he says, look, I, I want you to bear fruit. He said, if you're not bearing fruit, I'm not happy with you. He said, if you are bearing fruit, I'm going to purge you. I'm going to work with you. I'm going to disciple you. I'm going to get the sin out of your life. I'm going to make it so that you have the ability to bear more fruit. He said, if you want to glorify me, he said, bear fruit. He said, bear much fruit. I want fruit. But then he says this, I don't want you only bearing fruit. He says, I want you to bear fruit that's going to remain. He says, I want you to bear fruit that's going to continue. Now, just real quickly, go over to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28, and I know these verses are uh, familiar to you, but I want you to understand a few things. Just by way of introduction this morning, I, I want you to, to, to understand a few things. Now, Faithful Word is a soul-winning church, and praise the Lord for it. We need as many soul-winning churches as, as we can get. Verity Baptist Church is a soul-winning church. We believe in soul-winning. We emphasize soul-winning. Soul-winning is the number one most important thing that a church needs to be doing. Everything should be centered around the idea of bringing people to Christ, bearing fruit. But you need to understand something about soul-winning. In Matthew 28, we find what's known as the Great Commission, you know, and you find it in different places in the Gospels, but here Jesus goes through and explains to us, this is our purpose, this is our mission statement, this is what the church was created for, this is what we are to do, and I want you to understand something about the Great Commission, and it's something that I think we, we sometimes get confused about in Christianity. Soul winning is not the Great Commission. Soul winning is not the Great Commission. Now, soul winning is part of the Great Commission, but it is not the Great Commission. 
And sometimes we get, you know, kind of boastful and, and we go out and we get people saved and praise the Lord for it. We should go out. We should get people saved. We should knock on doors. We should spend hours. But you got to understand, God did not commission us to go out and just bear fruit. He wants us to bear fruit that remains. Amen. Now, here's what's interesting. Soul winning is not the Great Commission. It's part of the Great Commission. If you, if you look at Matthew 28, 19, look what he says. He says, go ye therefore. You notice the Great Commission is divided into three steps. Number one, he says, and teach all nations. That first teach there is what we would refer to as soul winning. Go ye therefore into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. Knock on doors, two by two, house by house. Get people saved. Praise the Lord for it. That's part of it. But notice, that's not the end of it. Number two, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. The second part of the Great Commission is to not just get somebody saved, but then bring that somebody and get them baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Number three, look at verse 20. Teaching them, and this is probably the, the hardest and most time-consuming part of the Great Commission, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. So see, if we are to fulfill the Great Commission, we are not just going to go soul winning. We're going to go bear fruit, yes. But then we're going to take that fruit and we're going to baptize those individuals and then we're going to bring them to church. That's the purpose. You say, why do you guys have, you have church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Pastor Anderson is constantly preaching the Bible, constantly preaching all these verses, constantly preaching. Why is he doing all that? Here's why he's doing all that. Because he's trying to teach you to observe all things whatsoever he commanded us. That's the Great Commission. Now here's what you understand. Soul winning produces fruit. The Great Commission, when completely fulfilled, produces fruit that remains. Amen. Because you can get somebody saved, yes. But when you get that individual saved, and then you get them baptized, and then you bring them to church, and they begin to grow, and they begin to learn, and they begin to get the sin out of their life, and they begin to produce fruit themselves, now we've fulfilled the entire commission that God called us to do. Soul winning produces fruit. The Great Commission produces fruit that remains. And I want to preach and teach a very, very, very practical lesson this morning, okay? And, and, and I want to give you a few things that maybe you can do in your life. But I want to ask you a few questions. Now, please, don't answer these questions out loud, right? Don't raise your hand. This is something for you to answer within your own heart. But let me ask you this. Number one, how many people are you seeing saved on a regular basis? Are you seeing anybody saved? Now, I know, I know many of you are seeing people saved. Praise the Lord for it. Some of you right there, we can just stop right there and say, you say, I've never seen somebody saved. I've never led a soul to Christ. I've never, you need to go out soul winning. You need to memorize the verses. You need to get with somebody. You need to learn how to knock the doors. And, and we're not saying you got to go preach the gospel next week, but you need to go be a silent partner next week. You need to go learn and realize that, look, if you're not bearing fruit, Jesus has no use for you. And in other passages, he says, you're, you're, you're taking up space. He said, you're, you're wasting my time. He said, I'm glad you got saved. But if you're not going to jump on board on this thing that I call the Great Commission, he said, I don't have any use for you. So if right there you say, I haven't ever seen anybody saved. You need to take care of that. You need to see somebody saved. But for those of you and for many of you, I'm sure, who have seen people saved, here's question number two. How many of the people that you, I'm not saying faithful word. I'm not saying Pastor Anderson. I'm saying you. How many of the people that you've led to the Lord have you seen come and be baptized at church? Answer that question. I mean, could you say, yeah, I've seen people saved and baptized? Or you say, man, I, I've seen hundreds of people saved, thousands of people saved, but I've never seen any of them baptized. There's a problem there. There's an issue there. We're, 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 we're gun ho about one part of the commission. And I'm, look, I'm all for soul winning. If we're going to be unbalanced anywhere, let's be unbalanced in the part that gets people out of hell. I understand that. But if we're not going to take people through the steps of the Great Commission, you're going to bear a whole lot of fruit, but you're never going to have fruit that remains. How many of your converts have you seen baptized? How many of your people that you've seen baptized, saved and baptized, how many have you seen them come to church regularly, attending church and begin to grow? Now here's the question. Do you believe that God wants you to have fruit that remains? Yes. Now here's the thing. Not do you believe faithful word. Okay. Faithful word is seeing fruit that remains. Here's the proof of it. Faithful word is seeing people saved and baptized and growing. I'm saying you as a Christian, you personally, you individually, you church member, you mom and dad and, and, and single adult. How many people have you seen saved and you seen baptized and you seen to start coming to church and start growing? And you know, what I'm talking about this morning, uh, I especially, go, go to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1. 
I, this is for everyone, but you know, I especially want to talk to those of you men that are pastors or are going to be pastors. You know, we're all young pastors here. We're all uh, young in the ministry, but you know, bro Brother Dave is a new pastor. Not, a, not, not young, he's, he's, he's mature, you know, but he's a new pastor. Brother uh, Don is going to be starting a church here in August, right? New pastor. Some of you guys, I know, whether you know it or not, your pastor has a vision to see you go start churches and to go, you know, uh, start other churches like Faithful Word. And some of you men, God is going to use you to plant churches all throughout this country. And you need to understand, you need to grasp this idea because you know what? L let's just face it, all right? C could I be kind of real with you? Okay, listen. I completely understand that I do not have the talent or the ability of Pastor Anderson. Okay, no one's leaving beautiful Hawaii to move to, to my church. You know what I mean? Okay, and, and you may, and that may be you. Okay, you may not be the next internet sensation. And if you're going to, if you're going to be the pastor that's going to have the growing church that God wants you to have, you may just have to learn to get somebody saved and get them in church. And by the way, that's what God wants for all of us. And that's what, you know, I was, I was thinking about, brother, brother, you, you want an example of fruit that remains? Brother Dave last night, man, that was a great sermon last night, that Pastor Burzins preached. You know, and Pastor Burzins came to Faithful Word, he was already saved, but he got baptized here. He got discipled here. He got, he learned here, he learned soul winning here, he learned doctrine here, he learned the Bible here. Now he's going on and pastoring. That's what we want. And by the way, that's what you want. You, 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 say, you may say, I, I'll never pastor church, or I'm not qualified, or, or, you know, I've got things in my past, and you may never pastor church, but could you produce the next church planner? Could you produce the next pastor? Could you produce the next individual that's going to go? Could you maybe be the one that will reach the next Pastor Anderson, the next Pastor Burson, the next Brother Donnie, the next individual that's going to go out and preach the gospel? It's important that we not just focus on seeing people saved. It's important that we're seeing on Having fruit, yes, but fruit that remains. Are you there in 1 Timothy chapter 1? Look at verse 2. I want you to just notice something in Scripture. The, the first step to kind of understanding this, okay, is we've got to just take responsibility for ourselves. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 2, you see the, the Apostle Paul, he says, he says a very interesting thing. He says, unto Timothy, my own son, notice this, in the faith. Do you see that? Okay, Timothy was not Paul's physical son. Timothy was an individual that Paul had gone saved, or maybe like brother, by Pastor Burson's, maybe he didn't necessarily get him saved, but he was instrumental in the discipleship and bringing up of that individual. And when Paul writes a letter to Timothy, he refers to him as a son. He says, unto Timothy, my own son, and he makes it clear, you're not my physical son, but you're my son, notice, in the faith. Go, to, go, go down to verse number 18. Notice what he says. 1 Timothy 1.18. He says, this charge I commit unto thee. Notice what he says. Son Timothy. Do you see that? Go to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Look at verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1. 2 Timothy 2.1. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1. The Bible says this. Thou therefore, notice, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Go to Titus chapter number 1. You're there in 2 Timothy. Just turn over a little bit to Titus chapter 1. Look at verse 4. Notice what he says to Titus. Titus chapter 1 verse 4. He says to Titus, notice, mine own son after the common faith. So again, another individual that Paul had gone saved, baptized, brought him through, taught him the Bible. He says, this is my son my son in the common, or after the common faith. Go to Philemon uh, verse 10. Philemon 1.10 there, the next book after Titus, Philemon 1.10, he says, he says, I beseech thee, notice what he says, for my son Onesimus. Do you see that? He says, for my son Onesimus. Go to 1 Peter, go past Hebrews, past James, 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, look at verse 13. This is, this is not Paul anymore, this is the Apostle Peter. Notice what he says, 1 Peter 5, 13. He says, the church that is in Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you. Notice what he says, and so doth Marcus my son. Do you see that? Now Mark is there is probably referring to John Mark, the writer of the gospel according to Mark, but he refers to Mark, he says, Mark is my son. Now look, that wasn't his physical child, but you gotta understand, in the Bible there's this idea that when you get somebody saved, when you get somebody born again, when you were used instrumentally there to see somebody saved, it, they, they become your spiritual child. 
Be they become your spiritual baby. Right. And it is your job, and you must take that responsibility upon yourself to see them grow and, 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 and become the mature Christian that God wants to be. What would you and I, you know, what would we think of a, of a mother? You know, she gives birth to a child. The midwife's cleaning up, getting ready to go. Mid you know, the, the midwife tries to hand the baby to the mother, and mom says, no, no, no. Look, I just give birth to them. I don't raise them. I mean, we would think that's silly. What do you think of a mom that gave birth in a hospital and she walks out of the hospital? All right, my job's done. I had a child. Somebody else raised them. Okay, but that's what we're doing spiritually. We knock on somebody's door. We present to them the gospel. We go through the verses. We explain it. We make sure they understand. We pray with them. Praise the Lord for it. We get them saved and it's like, see ya. Good luck with that. That's not what Paul did. That's not what Peter did. He said, look, you're my son. He said, and, you know, at our church, uh, often, because I, I preach this and teach this at our church, and I'll have newer soul winners come to me. They'll come with me with a three-by-five card. They'll say, Pastor, I got so-and-so saved. You know, here you go. And I'll say, what do you want me to do with that? Oh, you follow up with them. And I said, look, God gave you that child. God instructed him to you. If, if God wanted me to take care of him, then he would have gave him to me. But he gave him to you. So it's your responsibility to pray and love and care for that child. You're there in, in 1 Peter, go to 2 Peter chapter 3, look at verse 18, one known verses I know, but let's just look at them together. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. This is God's will for your life. This is God's will for every Christian's life. 2 Peter 3, 18, he says, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. God wants every Christian to grow. God wants every Christian to be matured. God wants every Christian to be baptized. He wants every Christian to come to church. He wants every Christian to be saved. Do you believe that? Now look, we understand not everybody's going to. But that's what he wants. And he gave you a child and we need to come to the place where we say, you know what, I'm going to take responsibility for this individual. I don't know about everybody else, but this guy that I got saved, or this gal that I got saved, I'm going to take responsibility, and I'm going to try to do everything that I can to make sure that they grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And uh, let, me, let me give you the good news. Here, you know, that was kind of all introduction just to kind of get us in the right mindset to understand what we're talking about this morning. Here's the good news. That can be pretty overwhelming. Having a child is pretty overwhelming. I mean, giving birth is, is, a, is, is hard work for the ladies. But you know what? As soon as you're done uh, giving birth, there's still a lot of work to do. There's still a lot of commitment to do. There's years and years and years and years of work ahead of you to raise that child to the place where God wants them to be. And the good news for you is this. You are not alone. You don't have to sit there and think, oh, good night. What am I going to do? I just got this person saved. Now, you know, how am I going to get him baptized? And how am I going to bring him to church? And how, how am I going to teach him all these things? The, the good news is that you're not alone in this. Are you there in Ephesians chapter 4? Look at verse 11. Ephesians 4, 11, The Bible says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some, here's you, here's what he gave you, and some pastors and teachers. God has given you a pastor. God has given you teachers. Why did he give you that? Why did he give you Faith Forward Baptist Church? Why did he give you such a great church that teaches so much Bible, that instructs so much, that will help you? Why did he do that? Verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. So see, you don't, you don't have to think there and think, well, how am I going to get somebody who's never heard of Jesus Christ or never understood the gospel of Jesus Christ, get them saved and bring them to the place where they're you know, ready to start a church? How are you going to do that? You don't have to do it on, on your own. You have a community here that you have a pastor here that is going to help you to be able to fulfill that role. So here's the thing. You don't have to go and teach that individual everything about the Bible. Now, it'd be good for you to teach them a few things. But really, all you got to do is get them to church. And if you get them to church, guess what? Three times a week, Pastor Anderson is going to stand up and teach them doctrine and teach them Bible and teach them to get the sin out of their lives and teach them to uh, start producing new habits of Bible reading and prayer and tithing and soul winning. And, you're not, and you can just come alongside that teaching and say, hey, wasn't that good? Would you like to come soul winning with me? Yeah. Hey, wasn't that good? What do you think about that? Hey, let me get you a Bible. Let me, let me help you learn how to pray. And you can come alongside. You're not on your own. you got a great tool right here. I want to give you just some practical things. So see, sometimes you teach these type of things and people say, well, well, what do I do? How do I do this? Okay. And I'm talking to those of you that are soul winners. And again, those of you that aren't soul winners, start soul winning. <laughs> 
Those of you that are not getting people saved, start getting people saved. That's your first step. But those of you who say, you know, I, I, I know how to give the gospel. I've seen people saved, you know, but I've never seen someone come to church. I've never seen someone baptized. What can I do? And I, I want to I just give you some practical things that you could begin uh, to do in regards to that. Even this coming week, this week, as you go out soul winning, a few things you can do. Number one, when you get somebody saved, pray for your converts. Pray for your converts. Now, I know, look, I, I'm a pastor. I preach every week. I get it. We say things, and they, they, they sound trite. They, they sound like it's just an oblig uh, uh, obligatory statement. Oh, well, of course, we're supposed to pray for our converts. No, honestly, ask yourself this question. Those of you that get people saved, ask yourself this question. When's the last time you got someone saved, and then you got on your knees, and you prayed for that individual by name for the next seven days? Well, I just get them saved and kind of forget about them. That's an issue. That's a problem. We, if that was your physical child and you just, well, I gave birth to them, there you go. We would say, you're a dirtbag parent. And yet, you know, we, we go out, we knock on doors, we get people saved, so and so got saved. You know, what, how hard it is, is it to go home and get on your knees and say, Lord, I want to pray for so and so who just got saved. And spend the next seven days just praying for that individual. Don't, don't let that just be the strike. Prayer works. I mean, in the passage, we're talking, he said, you know, if my words abide in you, he said, you shall ask what you will. He said, I'll answer your prayers. And sometimes they say, well, I'd like to see people saved. I'd like to see people come to church. I'd like to see people disciples. But we don't even pray about it. No, you have not because you ask not. The first thing we should be doing for all of our converts is praying for them. Pray for them. And guess what? To be able to pray for them by name, you're going to have to remember their name. <laughs> to be able to pray for them by name, you may have to write down their name and say, I'm going to pray for so-so. I'm going to commit to praying for so-so every day for the next seven days or whatever. Just the next day, for the next month, whatever it is, pray for your converts. Number two, you, if you want to see fruit that remains, especially those of you that are starting churches and you're going to, uh, you're, you're, you're starting with nothing. You may want to consider following up on some of your converts. Now let me, let me just explain something to you, alright? When, when I say follow up, here's what I don't mean. Bothering and, and, and you know, uh, stalking people that aren't interested in coming to church, okay? That is not what we're talking about. You know, when we say follow up, I'm not, saying, I'm not talking about you're hiding in the bushes waiting for them to come home, alright? <laughs> You want to follow up on people that are interested in coming to church. And, and I'll be honest with you. I don't, I, don't, I don't follow up and work on every person that I get saved. I work on people that are interested. And, and, you, and those of you that are soul winners, you know this is true. Some people get saved and they're not interested in coming to church. Look, if they don't want to come to church, they don't want to be bothered, don't worry about them. That's not your fault. That's their fault. But if you're a soul winner, you've said this to yourself before. When you got somebody saved and you walked away from that door and you said to yourself, man, I think that person, man, I think they might actually come. And, and you sense something in them, the way they were talking or the way they were thinking, or they just said, yeah, I want to come to church. And you think to yourself, man, I think they might actually come. We've all said that before. Now, most of them don't come. But some of them you walk away and you're like, yeah, they got saved. They got it. They understood it. But that person never come to church. And sometimes we walk away and we're like, I think that guy might actually come. That's the guy you want to pray for. That's the guy you want to follow up on. That's the guy, you, you do not want to follow up on people that are interested. Now, sometimes people ask me this, well, how do you know if they're interested? I know this is deep, complicated stuff. Some people spend a lot of money going to Bible college to learn these things, okay? How do you know if they're interested? You ask them. <laughs> <laughs> when I get somebody saved, I ask them this question. Would you be interested in coming to church on Sunday? Now, when they said to me, well, I don't know, I work on Sundays. Uh, I don't know, you know, Sundays is the day that the family and I, we go on picnics. When they say it to me, here's what I, here's what I hear, not interested. All right, well, listen. Here's an invitation to our church. Here's the map. We'd love for you to come. God bless you. But when somebody says to me, yeah, I think I'd be interested in coming to church. Guess what? They're probably interested in coming to church. That's the individual you want to uh, follow up with. You want to. And let me just give you, let, let me give you uh, just, just one, one, one person that like honestly, if, if, if you get this individual, even if you say, I don't want to follow up on anybody, honestly, write it down and give it to somebody who does want to follow up with. If you're ever knocking on a door, and somebody says this to you, even if they weren't saved, like let's say you got them saved, and then they explain to you like, I just, if they say these words, I just moved into town, and I used to go to so-and-so church, and I'm looking for a new church. If they just moved into town, and they used to go to church, and they're looking for a new church, you want to jump on that individual. Because today people, we live in a society where people just have a lack of character, lack of discipline. And if you can find an individual who's already used to going to church, 
even if they went to a bad church, let's say you just got them saved, but they already have the habit of going to church and they just moved into town and they're looking for a new church, usually the first church they go to is the one they're going to get plugged into. You want to jump on that individual. All right. So just kind of for those of you, uh, if you because I hear that from time to time, people say to me like, yeah, I used to go. I, I went to so and so church. I just moved into town three weeks ago and I'm looking for a church to go to. I'm thinking to myself, what's your name? <laughs> I want to pray for you. All right. So you want to follow up on individuals that are actually interested. OK, don't stalk people. Don't bother people. If they don't care, if they say, I work on Sundays. I don't know. I'm not really into church. All right. God bless you. Have a good day. We'd love for you to come. But if someone says, yeah, I think I'd like to come. Or, yeah, I think I might consider doing that. That's someone you may want to pray for. You may want to follow up on. Number three, if you're going to have fruit that remains and you're going to get individuals to, to get baptized and come to church, if you're going to get them to come to church, you're going to have to actually get them to come to church. All right. And what you're going to need is you're going to need their contact information. All right. Now, I know sometimes people say to me, like, well, it's all it's awkward asking people for their address or it's awkward asking people for their phone number. And here's what here's what I've done. And, and again, I want you to say I'm not I'm not the you know, I, I'm, I'm learning like anyone else. I'm, I'm giving you tips that have worked for me that I've seen people come to church as a result for this. They may work for you. They, you may do them different. You may do whatever you want. That's fine. I'm just telling you things that I do. Here's what I usually, when I get somebody saved and I say, hey, would you be interested in coming to church with me on Sunday? And they say, yeah, I think I might be interested. You know, I just came into town. I'm looking for a church to go to. I like to ask them this. I say, would you, um, I, I, I tell them this. I'd like to pray for you. Now, don't lie. If you're going to tell them you'd like to pray for them, get, you better pray for them. That's good. You say, I'd like to pray for you. And you know what? I'd like to maybe send you something from our church. Would it be okay if I write down your address? Now, here's the thing, okay? You're at their door. You can get their address without them giving it to you, right? But when you ask them for their address and then they give it to you, guess what? They're already under the understanding that you're going to follow up with them because they're giving you their address. Take a 3x5 card with you. I try to have a 3x5 card with me every time I, I go out soul winning. I say, hey, I'd like to pray for you. I'd like to mail you something from our church. Could I, could I write down your name? Bro, you know, Joe Smith, what's your address? They give me their address. I'll, I'll say, can I get your phone number? Maybe I'll give you a call or something. They give me their phone number. I write down their information, and that's a good way. If, if you've already said, could I, could I send you something from our church? And they said, yeah, you know, yeah, that'd be great. Then you already got permission. So just ask them for their address. It won't be weird after that, all right? Number, whatever number we're on. Give yourself a reason to follow up. Oftentimes people say to me, like, it's awkward following up on someone, okay? But here's the thing. It's weird to, like, call someone for no reason. Hey, I'm just calling because <laughs> I want you to come to church. Okay, that's weird. <laughs> I'm just at your door. Why are you here? Because I want you to come to church. You want to give yourself a reason to follow up with individuals. Now, here's the thing. And, and, and I'm not, you know, you, you pastors, you, you can do this differently and you have different resources. And, and if, if you'd like, I can give you some things that we do at our church if you're interested in that. But I, I want to talk to those of you that are just members, soul winners at, at Faith Forward Baptist Church. Here's what I would do if I were you. I got somebody saved. I think your, your biggest group goes out on Sunday. Is that right? Okay, um, we have a group that goes out on Sunday. Our biggest group goes out on Saturday, but we definitely have a, a group that's probably as big that goes out on Sunday afternoons. Now, here's the problem, okay? And you just got to think through these things logically. You go out on Sunday afternoon, knock on someone's door, you get them saved. They actually seem interested. Yeah, I think I want to come to church Sunday. Then, seven days later, Sunday rolls around, and you're like, man, he didn't show up. Okay, seven days just went by. Or maybe you got them saved on Saturday. They didn't come the next Sunday, but they're supposed to come the one after that. You know, a week just went by. Most people are going to forget. All right? So here's something that you can do. You go to church, and you get yourself one of those free CDs Pastor Anderson likes to give you. And you find one that might be good for a new Christian. Maybe one about church attendance. Maybe one that's about baptism. That'd be a good one. Maybe one that has to do with Bible reading. All right? And you go home, and you grab a little card from the 99 cent store, and you write on there, you, you write a handwritten note. You say, Dear Joe Smith. I want to let you know that I've been praying for you this week. Thank you for letting me talk to you. P.S. Here's a CD that I think would help you in your spiritual walk. And you send them in the mail a CD about baptism, a CD about church attendance, a CD about prayer, a CD about, uh, you know, reading the Bible. Now, you can send them a CD about whatever you want, but those subjects are generally the ones that you want to probably give to a new Christian. You want to give them the military industrial complex, go right ahead, okay? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's fine. But, you know, generally you want to give somebody something that a new Christian could really, church attendance is going to be a good one. It's going to encourage them to go to church. Bible reading is going to be a good one. It's going to encourage them to read their Bible. Baptism is going to be a good one. It's going to encourage them about baptism. So you find one of those CDs, you put it in the mail, you send it to them. This is how this looks, all right? Sunday you get someone saved. 
They got saved. They said, I want to come to church the next week. Praise the Lord. I'm excited for you. I'd like to pray for you. Can I write down your information? Sure. Give me your address. On Tuesday or Wednesday of that next week, they get a handwritten letter from you that says, hey, I wanted to thank you for letting me talk to you on Sunday. Here's a CD. I think it'll help. They pop that thing in their car as they go to work the next day and they hear a whole sermon on baptism. And then you call them up on Saturday afternoon. Now, here's the thing. You have a reason to call. You say, what's the reason? Hey, I sent you something in the mail. Did you get it? Yeah, I got it. Thanks. Hey, listen, we still on for tomorrow? Now, you want to call them on Saturday to remind them, look, days have gone by. These people are not in the habit of going to church. They've been going to work. They've been going to softball leagues and, you know, bowling leagues. They've been doing whatever they do throughout the week. They don't remember that a week ago they committed with you to go to church. So you put something in the mail. They get it Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You call them on Saturday. Say, hey, did you get that thing I sent you in the mail? Yeah, I got it. Thanks a lot. That was great. I learned a lot. Hey, listen, we still on for tomorrow? Yeah, yeah, I think I want to make it. You just reminded them. I want to come to church on Sunday. Now listen, you say, well, that's, that sounds like a lot of work. Raising children is a lot of work. Bringing someone to spiritual maturity is a lot of work. And if you want, look, if you want to just see people saved and never see them again, have at it. Praise the Lord for it. There's no, I mean, that's great. Get people saved. But if you want to be able to say, here's my convert. Here's my Timothy. Here's my son in the faith. You may have to put some time and effort and thinking into some of these things. They get something from you in the mail. You call them on Saturday. And you say, okay, I call them on Saturday. They told me they're coming to church. Is that it? That is not it. Here's the most important step, all right? You call them on Sunday morning. <laughs> and you call them at an hour before Sunday morning. Now, there's a reason why you call every time or visit. You say, why do you call them on Saturday? To remind them that they were going to come to church on Sunday. They agreed that they were going to come to church on Sunday. You say, why do you call them on Sunday morning? To wake them up. <laughs> That's why you call them, honestly. You know, I used to, I used to call people, we, we, would pick pe we would pick people up for church, and uh, I would call them 15 minutes before I got there, I'd say, hey, I'm going to be there in 15 minutes. They'd be like, oh man, I just woke up. I'm not going to be able to make it. So now I just call an hour before. I say, hey, I'm going to be there in an hour. Oh man, I'm glad you called. I, my alarm didn't go off, you know. Or you're, they're supposed to meet you at church, you know. Hey, now you say you need a reason to call. Make up a reason. Call them on Sunday and say, hey, I, wanted to t I, wanted to, I forgot to tell you on Saturday, we want to have you over for, uh, for lunch after church on Sunday. Don't worry about lunch. It's on us. We're going to have you over. My wife's making a meal. Make up a reason to, 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 to call them, but call them and just get them there. Now listen, you are going to get people saved. You're going to send them something in the mail. You're going to call them on Saturday. You're going to call them an hour before. They're going to say, yeah, I'll be there. You're going to drive to the house, knock on their door, and some of them are going to say, I'm sorry, we're not going to make it. <laughs> okay, that's going to happen. But you're going to see way more people coming to church and you're going to see way more people getting baptized. If you actually take some responsibility and say, this is my child, and I'm going to do everything that I can, God gave me the responsibility to see this individual saved. This is what God wants you to do. Go to uh, 1 John. 1 John chapter number, I'm sorry, 3 John. 3 John chapter 1. Third John chapter one. Third John chapter one, and I'd like you to see verse four. John said this, he said, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Now John may have been talking about physical children, but most people agree that he's talking about his spiritual children. And John said this, I have no greater joy. He said, there's nothing that brings me more joy than to see an individual that I got saved. That because of my ministering in their life, they got baptized. That because of me, they don't have everything perfect. And by the way, you start getting new people saved that never went to church, you're going to get some weird people in church, all right? Just get used to that. They're going to be odd. They're going to have all sorts of, you know, problems. And, and you may have to, you know, help them with gas from time to time. And that's fine. But he says, I have no greater joy than seeing an individual who, when I met him, was on their way to hell. And now they're growing. And now they're learning. And now they're pastoring. And now they're getting people. He said, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And I just want to, I want to plant a, a seed in your mind. Just, just imagine with me. You know, Faithful Word has been growing a lot. And, and I hear the news of it. And it's exciting. And every time I come to, to the camp camping trip. I always meet new people, people I've never met, and, and it's exciting. This church is growing and it's thriving. But could you imagine what would happen at Faithful Word Baptist Church if every individual in this church 
made it their personal responsibility? If it wasn't just Pastor Anderson, if it wasn't just Mrs. Anderson, if it wasn't just, you know, a, key, a, a few of the leaders that were kind of interested in making sure people got baptized and making sure that people were coming to church and making sure that people were learning, but if every soul winner in this church made it their responsibility and said, I'm going to, by the grace of God, this time next year, have someone sitting next to me who got saved, who got baptized, who's coming to church. Yeah, I got help from Pastor Anderson. Yeah, I got help from other people. Yeah, I got encouragement from other people. But basically, they're here because of my ministering in their life. I mean, could you imagine what would happen in this church? I'll tell you exactly what would happen in this church. It would happen what happened in the church of Jerusalem. It would begin to multiply. Because one person can only do so much work. But when you say, I'm going to get, I, I just want one. I just want one baptism this year. I just want one, you know, I'll get hundreds of people saved this year. But if I can just have one of them come to church, one of them get baptized, one of them start coming on Sundays, and start coming on Sunday night, start coming on Wednesday night. If I can just one, get one individual, this church, the impact that this church could make would just be amazing. And you would be able to say like John and say, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. This is what God wants for you. This is what I want for you. This is what Pastor Anderson wants for you. That you would not just bear fruit. Praise the Lord for the fruit. But that you would bear fruit that remains. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Thank you for our church. And Lord, thank you for our faithful word. And Father, I pray that you would just bless us as we continue to minister to people, as we continue to try to help people. Lord, I pray that you'd put a burden in our hearts, Lord, to, to see people saved and praise the Lord for it. We're not, I'm not minimizing that at all. Thank you for the countless of salvations and the, the people that get saved, that they would never come to church and they would never uh, uh, get baptized, and, but they are saved and they are on their way to heaven. That's the most important thing we could do in an individual's lives. But Father, I pray that you would put a burden in every soul winner in this church. Lord, I, I, I can just imagine the impact that this church would have if everyone said, I just want one. I just want one. Uh, this year, I want to see somebody, one of my converts, baptized. Lord, I pray that there'd be individuals in this room right now, they've never gone soul winning, never got anybody saved, that they would just burden, that you'd burden their hearts, that they would make a choice right now. I want to see somebody saved. And Lord, those that have seen people saved and never seen them baptized, never seen them growing, Father, I pray that you'd burden their hearts to say, I not only want to see somebody saved, I want to see somebody saved and baptized. And Lord, I pray that you'd begin to burden individuals, that there would be individuals in this church that would begin to bear fruit that remains. And Lord, that we would have a great harvest. And that from that fruit, we would see men like Timothy and men like Titus, that we would see men rise up and go and start churches. And, and, and just the impact that we could make, Lord, would be so great. Father, we love you. Thank you for allowing us to take part in the ministry of reconciliation. Thank you for allowing us to be able to have the opportunity to invest ourselves into individuals that we could say like John, I have no greater joy. We love you, Lord. In your precious name I pray. Amen. Amen.